One of the absolute necessities in Christian ministry today is that of having a kingdom mindset. God has called us to build his kingdom. Kingdom building is recognizing that Christ is the king of the kingdom and that it is not about building our own empires but about building people by the Holy Spirit. This series titled The Kingdom Builders will help us understand how God takes each one of us to fulfill his visions and dreams for kingdom expansions. Stay tuned. Greetings and thank you for tuning in to Living Strong. Uh, today will be our last episode in the series on Kingdom Builders, uh, where we've been teaching directly out of our book uh, called Kingdom Builders. This is a revised and enlarged second edition of the book. We hope you've got your copy by now. If you still haven't received your copy, we'd encourage you to request for your free copy of this book. Or if you prefer uh, an electronic version of it, you can get it off our church website and use it for your own study. 
use it to teach it from uh, at your church or uh, you can uh, teach it in the conferences for Christian leaders and pastors uh, and impart these truths and the grace and the anointing on this whole topic uh, into the lives of uh, many others. In this final telecast on uh, Kingdom Builders, uh, we, would, we want to talk about the fact that in the Kingdom of God, uh, we are brothers and fathers and or you could say sisters and mothers and in that context, uh, we need to work towards raising up the next generation of believers or kingdom builders. Let's talk about being brothers and fathers first. You know, as, as kingdom builders, very often we can so focus uh, on doing the work of the kingdom that we forget that we are not just co-workers with one another, but we are also brothers and fathers uh, to each other in the body, in the kingdom of God. And we must maintain that understanding. Otherwise, all our interactions will be very transactional in nature. I uh, will be more focused on work and ministry. And we will forget the relational aspect of being brothers and fathers uh, in the kingdom of God. And I'm using the term brothers and fathers in a very generic sense, also referring to sisters and mothers or, uh, you know, this relational aspect that we have in the kingdom of God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 2, Paul writes about Timothy and he says, And I sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. What I like here is when Paul is addressing or referring to Timothy, who is a kingdom builder, a fellow worker, he calls him a brother, a minister of God, and a co-worker, a fellow laborer. So he recognizes the fact that Timothy is not just a minister of God, he's not just a fellow laborer, but he's also a brother. Too often all our interactions are with one another are based on the fact that we are all ministers of God or that we are all fellow workers and we forget that we are actually brothers with one another. A, a, a relational aspect, the fact that there is a bond that we have in the kingdom of God that is beyond our work aspect, the work we do for kingdom building. And we must learn to truly be brothers or fathers or mothers or sisters in the kingdom of God. We are born for a, a brother. When we, when we develop this relational aspect in the kingdom of God as leaders, as as heads of ministries and so on, and we develop our, our brotherly relationship, then we understand that, uh, that a brother is born for adversity. In Proverbs 17 and verse 17, the Bible says, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. You know, if I only relate to other men of God as ministers of God and as fellow workers, and I forget that relational aspect of being a brother to other ministers of God, then when each one of us are in trouble, in difficulty, and we will all be in, we will all face challenges in life, then we have no more, nobody to turn to because we've only been relating to each other as ministers of God. But when we relate as brothers, uh, then we know that when one of us are in trouble, there are many others around them who will come to their help and come to their aid. And here's a personal challenge, you know, uh, what does it mean to be a brother to another minister of God? It means that I, uh, I need to spend time with that person to really get to know that person. I need to spend time with him and maybe even with his family, get to know them, get to know how he treats his wife and children. Uh, I need to spend time with him uh, at his church or his ministry office so I get to know his staff and see how he works with his staff. Uh, I need to invite him home uh, to my home or to my church or office. I need mean, to spend time if we worship, we pray, we seek God together. I need to pray for him. I need to have him to pray, to pray for me. I need to uh, stand by him in times of difficulty and journey with him through his times of difficulty. I need to be able to uh, be available to him when he needs me, counsel or advice. And similarly, I need to be able to reach out to him to receive counsel or advice when I need it. I need to be able to receive uh, what God is doing, uh, releasing through his life and gift and anointing and similarly, similarly he receives through my life, my gift and anointing that God's placed in me. I honor him for who he is in God and he honors me for who I am in God. We partner together, we work together as friends. 
be sacrificed and give to each other for their personal welfare and the family. Uh, if people hate or criticize him, I stand up in his defense and I remain his friend. And you know, we need to be such kinds of friends or brothers in the kingdom of God and not just do ministry work uh, as him and needed, but go beyond that to be brothers in the kingdom. And of course, when a brother stumbles, somebody is there to help. As it says in Galatians 6, 1, if a brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So when we have this relationship of being brothers together in the kingdom of God, then we're able to be there and help the other person back on their feet in case there is a need and they fall. Unfortunately, uh, what we are seeing in the body of Christ is this. We are seeing a uh, 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 man of God, women of God in great positions of leadership who claim to be walking in the light and yet they carry hatred in their hearts towards other fe towards fellow ministers. Uh, they, they are angry, they speak ill, they put other ministers down. And you know, that's very questionable if they're really walking in the light. Because as far as the scripture is concerned, this is what the Bible says. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, John says, He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause of stumbling for him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So, you know, we, we claim great things. We claim to be walking in the light uh, as leaders, as, as, as heads of ministries, as pastors. But then we are not able to even relate to another man of God. We are not relate to, able to love another man or woman of God and just be kind. And so it's questionable if we are really walking in the light. John says we are blinded. We don't even know where we are going. We are actually walking in darkness if we have hate towards other people. Now I understand that in many cities, in many places, uh, things have happened between men of God, between those in ministry, between uh, believers, and, and that, have, that have caused hurt and have caused pain. But you know, the time has come for us to put these things behind and choose to forgive and choose to forget and choose to love and rebuild trust. And that's what God really wants us to do is to really be brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God. And from that, we must learn to become fathers in the kingdom of God, which means as fathers, we nurture younger people to rise up into their calling. And that's what God's kingdom needs to see. We need to see in the kingdom of God. We need to see men and women of God rising up to become fathers and mothers in God's kingdom and nurture and raise up the next generation, the generations that come after us. Uh, who, people who can continue uh, with the vision, uh, with the work that God has released through us. You know, uh, there is this whole aspect of raising up children. We're talking about spiritual children. Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 to 15. Paul says, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So Paul is writing to the Corinthian believers and he says, look, you are my children, you're my beloved children. I've, I've birthed you in the kingdom. So there is this whole aspect of spiritual nurturing, spiritual children. And what we must keep in mind is that when we're talking about raising up the younger generation, raising up children uh, in the kingdom of God, you know, we're not talking about reproducing or making Xerox copies of ourselves. God doesn't produce Xerox copies. Uh, you know, it's not about that. It's not about just making identical copies of who we are, but rather be talking about imparting the grace, uh, the anointing, the revelation that God has given to us, imparting that to the generation that comes after us. Uh, and that's God's desire. Isaiah 59 and verse 21, God says, the anointing that's upon you and the word, the my spirit who's upon you and my word which I've put in your mouth, I will not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your children, nor from the mouth of your children's children or your descendants. So that's God's intent. He wants the anointing and revelation given to one generation to pass on to the next and to the generation that comes after them. So each generation should build upon uh, the foundations and build upon the work of the previous generation. 
unfortunately in the kingdom of God uh, that doesn't normally happen. You know, people come, they're great ministries, they do a great work, and then they disappear. They don't raise up, they don't pass on what they receive to the next generation. So then the next generation starts all over again. They start rebuilding, relaying the same foundation, working their way up, and, and they may or may not reach the same height as the previous generation. Now, that's not God's intent. What God desires is that the sealing of one generation becomes the starting point of the next generation. We pass on so that each generation can build uh, on where the previous generations have reached. So what we must understand as kingdom builders is that we must learn to be fathers and mothers in the kingdom of God. And what we want to do in the rest of our time here on this telecast is to look at Paul and Timothy. How did Paul the apostle nurture Timothy? You know, uh, Timothy was a young man that Paul found uh, in Lystra and he took him with him uh, and he nurtured Timothy to become a, a man who would do the work of the ministry the same way that Paul did the work of the ministry. And how did he do that? What are some of the elements we can find in, in Paul's epistles which show us how Paul nurtured Timothy? I want to very quickly highlight some of the things we can see from the epistles. You know, um, Paul, uh, first of all, there was, a, uh, there was a recognition of a divine connection that was set up. You know, Paul, on his first missionary journey, uh, he goes through uh, certain uh, cities called uh, Derbe, uh, Lystra, and Iconium. These are uh, uh, cities in the region of Galatia, uh, in that region. Uh, Paul travels through the, through the cities and even into Antioch in, 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 in Syria. So these are these four cities in the, in the region that's called Galatian. Paul travels through them uh, along with Barnabas on the first missionary journey. Uh, uh, what happens after that is when, when Paul and Barnabas return to Antioch in, uh, in Syria, there are some uh, Hebrew, uh, uh, some Jewish people, leaders who go through the same cities and they sow a lot of doubt and they sow a lot of uh, uh, wrong teaching in these same cities uh, among these new believers. Uh, they tell them that uh, they need to follow the law of Moses, they need to keep all the, uh, uh, they need to be circumcised, they need to keep all the rules of the Pharisees uh, in addition to believing in Jesus. So there's a lot of confusion and that's why Paul writes his epistle to the Galatians which is he's addressing these four churches of Derby, Lystra, Iconium and Antioch in, in, in that region and he writes the epistle of Galatia uh, to these uh, believers in uh, these four cities. And then on a second missionary journey, Paul comes to the same route. He goes to Derby, he comes to Lystra, and then he goes on to Iconium and so on. And we read about this in Acts 16, that when Paul comes into Lystra, he finds, uh, Acts 16 verses 1, 2, and 3, he finds a certain disciple whose name is Timothy. Uh, his mother is Jewish, his, his father is Greek, uh, and, 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 for, uh, and he had, Timothy has a good report, meaning uh, he's already a disciple, he's already a follower of Jesus. And Paul recognizes something on this young man and he decides that Timothy must become part of his ministry team and he welcomes Timothy to come join him. But what's also interesting here is that Paul takes Timothy and he circumcises him. He does this so that Timothy can have access to the Jews, he can have access into the synagogue and go in there and preach. Because to be a Jew you need to have your mother, should, your mother should be Jewish and you also need to be circumcised. And so Paul does that for Timothy's benefit and for the furtherance of the gospel. So it all begins with a divine connection. The next thing we see uh, is that Paul has a nurturing relationship with Timothy. Uh, he calls Timothy his son in the faith in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 2. To Timothy a true son in the faith. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 2 he says to Timothy a beloved son. So you see that uh, there is that sense of closeness, a, a, a nurturing father-son relationship that develops between Paul and Timothy. And that's important to have the kind of relationship if we want to raise up uh, 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 our Timothys. The third thing we see is that there is a closeness and a transparency that is be there between Paul and Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, You have carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long suffering, my love, my perseverance, persecutions, afflictions. So Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, you've had the opportunity 
to see very closely all these aspects of my life, not just my teaching, but also my way I live, my manner of life, my purpose, um, my faith, uh, my endurance, my going through difficult times, uh, how I love people. Uh, you've seen all of this, Timothy. So there's a closeness and a transparency that's there. And really, when we, when we want to nurture people, we will need to let them to see, see us for who we are. It's not just about them listening to our teaching, but they need to see how we live life, how we do things. They, they need to be able to have access to who we really are as people and not uh, just see the facade that we put up uh, in front of others. The fourth thing we see between Paul and Timothy is that Paul communicates specific instructions. He teaches Timothy. He tells him what to do. He tells him what not to do. He, uh, he encourages him. He, 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 he speaks into his life. And so uh, we need to do that. We need to speak instructions into uh, the younger generation. We need to clearly tell them uh, what it takes to uh, be uh, in the kingdom of God and do the work of the kingdom. The fifth thing we see is that Paul encourages, exhorts, and corrects Timothy. And that's something we need to, as fathers, we need to bring into the lives uh, of our Timothys. We need to encourage them. A lot of encouragement is needed. When they make mistakes, we do something wrong. Encourage, encourage, encourage. But also, Ty, there are times when we need to correct. Uh, if they're going off on a wrong direction, we need to bring correction into their lives. Sixthly, we see that Paul uh, clarifies the costs to Timothy. He doesn't sugarcoat the ministry. He tells Timothy that he needs to endure hardships uh, as a good soldier. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, he says, Don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but come be a partaker of the sufferings of the gospel. So he lets Timothy know that it's not an easy life doing the work of the kingdom. Seventh, we see that Paul places honor and on Timothy. He builds him up. He treats him with respect. Uh, in many places, he, he addresses Timothy with great respect. In 1 Timothy 6 and 11, he says, Timothy, but you, O man of God. In 2 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, he says, Timothy, our brother. In, uh, in Romans 16.21, he says, Timothy, my fellow worker. So really, he talks about Timothy uh, with high regard. He places honor on his life. You know, uh, that's something that is so lacking in the church today where leaders do not treat their subordinates or their younger generation with honor and respect and they don't build them up. They put them down. They uh, hold them down. They treat them as, as nothing. And listen, if you treat people as servants, they will behave like servants. But if you treat people as sons and daughters, they will grow up to be sons and daughters, people who are faithful to the house and people who serve gladly in the house. Uh, number eight, we see that Paul delegates and empowers Timothy. He delegates, he places responsibility on Timothy. He sends Timothy on assignments to Corinth, to Philippi, to Thessalonica. And he empowers him. He says, Timothy, go do it on my behalf. Go do it in my place. And, uh, and so we need to empower and encourage people to step out in the work of the kingdom. Uh, ninth, Paul recommends Timothy positively. When he writes about Timothy to other churches, he tells them, uh, he speaks highly of Timothy. And lastly, when the time comes, he releases Timothy to do what God's called him to do. He tells Timothy to take care of the church in Ephesus. On our program today, we have used the publication titled Kingdom Builders for our study. In this series, we discover what it takes for us to develop the heart of a kingdom builder. To get your free copy of the book, you can call us toll free at the number 1-800-300-00998. You can also send us an email tv at apcwo.org or log on to our website www.apcwo.org to download this publication and several other free resources. I knew I had the call for ministry but I was unable to pursue my studies in theology at a young age. Being in the corporate world I felt very insecure about my faith and saw the need to be equipped in God's Word. There were times when I felt inadequate to be effective in my ministry. It was then when someone told me about All People's Church Bible College and I considered joining the course. I have no words to express my gratitude to my mentors who have invested into my life and has equipped me to impact my world. 
it's never too late if you want to consider joining here i am shanti prince dine and nancy paul emmanuel come discover fulfill admissions are now open for the academic year starting july 2015 For inquiries regarding the course and other details, please do get in touch with us. You can download the application form from our website www.apcwo.org/biblecollege. You know, on the telecast today, we very, very, very quickly uh, condensed uh, in this telecast uh, an, an extensive teaching that is contained here in two chapters, chapter nine and chapter ten of this book, Kingdom Builders. Uh, we really spend uh, uh, about two hours covering those chapters, but we encourage you to get your copy of this book and study them in detail, so that you and I can learn how to be brothers uh, in the kingdom and how we can be fathers in the kingdom and nurture other people uh, into their call and into their destiny. Let's pray together before we close. Father, we just thank you for this entire series on kingdom builders, and uh, that uh, we've been able to spend several weeks. studying together on father i pray for a release of the grace and the anointing into the lives of people lord who 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 heard this teaching we pray that there will be a great work done in their hearts in their lives in their churches in their ministries in their cities in their communities god that your kingdom will come lord that there will be a change in the hearts and minds and lives of people so that lord mighty things can take place in them among them and through them we pray In Jesus name. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us on the telecast today and until next time remember live life the Jesus way.